Today we're taking a first look at the Tamron 150-500mm f5-6.7 to and, and a bunch of other letters new telephoto zoom lens for Sony. Let's get into it. Alright, so this is going to be part one of, I think, a two-part video series. I don't want to make this too long. This video is going to just take a first look at the design, the build quality. We'll show you all of the different things that physically are built into this lens and talk about my feelings after having used this for a couple of weeks now. And then in the second video, we'll take a look at uh, image quality, autofocus performance, VC performance, things like that. Um, so. Hopefully that will be coming in a couple of weeks. I wanna test it out a little bit more before I put that video together. But today, let's just take a look at this lens itself. Now the build quality, I think, is pretty solid. Uh, it's not metal, it's that kind of nice uh, quality plastic that you see in a lot of these G2 uh, Tamron lenses. It feels very similar to the 70 to 180 lens that I have here, which is a great lens. It does definitely feel solid though, and after having used several Tamron lenses for years, I'm not worried whatsoever about the build quality. This is gonna be a rugged enough lens. So without the rear or the front cap, but keeping that lens foot on there, this weighs just under two kilograms, you can see right there. It is obviously heavy, but I think for the focal range that you're getting, it's a reasonable weight. And at this weight, I think it was still comfortable enough to carry around for a few hours straight the other day. Um, I handheld it most of the day. I didn't really have any major complaints about the weight or the size. And speaking of the size, you can see that it's just about 20 centimeters long and then 27 with the lens hood on there. Of course, the barrel does extend when you zoom out to 500 millimeters. It's somewhere around 27 or 28 centimeters long uh, without the lens hood and about 34 centimeters long with that lens hood on there. If you're familiar with their 70 to 180 lens for Sony E-mount, uh, you can see the size comparison here when they're extended and then again when they're most compact. And I think this is not bad considering that the 150 to 500 pretty much picks up at the end of the focal range for the 70 to 180. Now in the back here, you do have this little rubber gasket indicating some level of moisture sealing, and it has a very nice uh, tight fit on the camera body, at least on the bodies that I've used it on. Just quickly running through a few more specs, this has a seven blade aperture, and we will take a look a little bit closer at the bokeh performance in the second video. Uh, and this is also, of course, a variable aperture lens. It goes from f5 to f6.7, a one-stop difference from the wide to telephoto end of the range. As a rough estimate, just from looking at the camera, it seems to jump from f5 to 5.6 at about 250 millimeters, and then it jumps up to f6.3 at about 400 millimeters, and it only jumps to f6.7 at the very end of the range, right up near 500 millimeters. Now I have found that aperture range very usable, uh, at least outdoors. If you're on a sunny day, there's no problems whatsoever. You can still get, I think, a pretty good shutter speed while keeping your ISO very, very low to stop motion uh, for animals or birds or things like that. Obviously, if you have a moving subject, if it starts to get cloudy or if it's closer to sunset and things are getting a little bit darker, you're gonna have to boost that ISO to keep your shutter speed high enough to stop the motion. But if your subject doesn't have any motion in it, then the VC in this lens also does work very well. And you can go down with some pretty low shutter speeds, even when hand holding, even out at 500 millimeters. So I did find this lens to be very usable. Of course, it's gonna depend on your subject. It's gonna depend on your camera. Um, but I did find that the uh, aperture range and the VC combination in this lens was very usable. Again, we'll do some more careful, non-scientific, but careful VC testing in the second video. You have an all metal lens foot or a tripod mount here on the lens and it does have some little loops here and on the other side if you want to hang this from a strap. I personally haven't done that but it is balanced quite well uh, in the center of the whole setup here if you want to do that. You can also use this knob here to completely remove the lens foot without having to take the lens off the camera to slide it off the back. This will completely open and hinge open so you can just pull it off the lens. And you do have a foot down here that is uh, Arca Swiss compatible. It has that compatibility built in, which is really nice if you have an Arca Swiss style head. You don't have to add anything additional on the bottom of here, but you do have a screw thread down there if you want to use something different. Now speaking of the center of balance, you can see here that the lens foot is very well placed. It balances really nicely here. So if you're hand holding and supporting it uh, with your hand under here, I found that it is really comfortable. And actually the focus ring is right there where it's pretty 
comfortable to grab if you want to use the manual focus ring while you're holding this in your hand. It is a very, very small focus ring. Uh, and in terms of the actual feel of it, it's just average. Um, but, you know, I don't think anybody's really gonna be buying this lens with the main focus being on manual focusing. Now moving up the lens a little bit, you can see that the zoom ring is much, much larger. And in terms of feel or the weight of it, I feel like they did strike a pretty good balance between it being stiff enough that uh, you have good control over it and you don't accidentally do anything you don't wanna do, but you can still zoom in and zoom out uh, quickly and easily while you're shooting. Uh, I haven't found any problems with a zoom creep, which is, you know, if you have the lens extended and you're pointing it up, where the barrel will, under its weight, kind of fall back in on itself, or the opposite if you're uh, pointing it down, where the barrel, under its weight, kind of pulls itself out. I haven't really found uh, any major problem with that in using this. Maybe it will loosen up over time and that could become a problem, but they did also build in this lock switch here. So in the 150 millimeter position, you can engage that lock. So if you're carrying it on a strap or if you are putting it into your bag, uh, it'll hold in place right there in the shortest position. But also uh, the zoom ring itself can slide out and that will lock it in at any point in the zoom range. So that is very, very useful if you're finding that you are having a problem. I have found that to be pretty useful when shooting, uh, even if it's not related to zoom creep, just it's nice to hold it in place where you want it uh, so you don't make any accidental changes. But I did also find that it is pretty easy to accidentally slide into the locked position. And backing up a little bit on the body of the lens, we have four switches here and Tamron has redesigned these switches a little bit. If you look at something like the EF mount 70 to 200, these switches kind of stick out from the body and they have kind of a sharp edge. So if you're carrying it around on a strap, for example, and it's rubbing against your leg, it was at times easy for those buttons, the switches to get stuck and accidentally switch, for example, from autofocus to manual focus mode without you realizing it. So here, they kind of raised the body of the lens around those switches and the sit switches sit flush with that section there. So the switches themselves are still easy enough to get to, easy enough to use, but they're not sticking out in a way that makes them easy to accidentally get switched out of the position you want them to be in. Like I said, you've got four switches and starting with the one up top here, we've got the focus limiter and you can go from the full range, which we'll talk about in just a second, or you can limit the close focus to only focus down to three meters or only focus down to 15 meters. And this can be very, very useful. For example, if you have branches close to you and you're trying to focus on something further away, you don't want the lens to get distracted by those branches in the way. Uh, you can limit it to only focus after three meters or only focus after 15 meters uh, so it'll stay on your subject without getting distracted. That can definitely be useful. I went shooting with this in a zoo and even in that circumstance you have a fence in front of the animals for example and using that focus limiter really helped so that way it didn't get distracted by that fence which was close to me uh, and it could stay focused on the animals behind them. Speaking of that close focus though this lens does have a surprisingly close close focus capability uh, just 0 0.6 meters on the wide end uh, and 1.8 meters on the long end. Now, that'll give you a pretty impressive reproduction ratio as well. You get one to 3.1 on the wide end and one to 3.7 on the long end. Considering that some lenses that only go up to 1.2 will actually physically mark themselves on the barrel a macro lens. I think this is pretty impressive. And for me, it was unexpected with this lens. And I really appreciated it because it felt like I really just wasn't held back at all. I could be fairly close to something and still focus on it, no problem. And it even let me get really up close to like a dragonfly and still take a picture of a dragonfly filling up like half the frame, which felt silly with such a huge lens, but it was really, really fun to do uh, some close-up photography with this super telephoto lens. After that, we've got your autofocus, manual focus switch. We've got your VC on, VC off switch, and we have three modes of VC in this lens. Mode one is your standard mode. Mode two, they say is exclusively for panning. And mode three, they say is framing priority. Now, I did find that it was a little bit difficult to judge the subtle differences in these just by looking through the viewfinder, but from as far as I can tell, framing priority seems to kind of settle into a more locked position when you stop moving the lens uh, to focus on that framing, of course. It really, really helps out 
hold your framing uh, when you're shooting. Mode two, the panning mode, of course, has a little bit more freedom, uh, so that way you don't get stuck when you're trying to pan from one side to the other with the VC fighting back against you. And then mode one, the standard mode, is kind of a mix of those two where it's maybe a little bit more stable in all directions, but it's not quite as extreme as the framing priority mode. Again, subtle differences maybe, but uh, there are those three modes to get the best of whatever situation you're in. Now up front we have this pretty solid standard round uh, lens hood, uh, and it does lock into position fairly securely, but there's no physical button on the hood to kind of really lock it into place like you do sometimes see. On the inside there we do have some texture to help deflect the light uh, against flaring and things like that. And there is also this rubber ring around the front that they say is supposed to be kind of shock absorbing and help to uh, prevent any cracks or damage. Obviously I don't have any way to test that without Tamron getting angry at me, uh, but I don't know, it's probably better than nothing. Under that lens hood, you have an 82 millimeter filter thread, which is really not very large for a 150 to 500 millimeter lens. I mean, 82 millimeters is the same as my uh, Sony 135 f2 lens. It's the same as my Sigma 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. So there's, there's a good chance that you might already have some filters in this size. It's a very reasonable size uh, for this big of a lens. You also do have Tamron's B-Bar G2 coating on here, which is supposed to help with flare and contrast, but I really didn't find any problems whatsoever with flare in real world use. I'll try to test it a little bit more carefully for the second part of this video, but in real world use, I didn't have a single problem with flare. And you do also have their fluorine coating on here on this front element, which is uh, oil and water repellent. So it's gonna make it easier to keep this front element clean, which I always appreciate. And just as a few final notes for this video, this works great with all of the focus modes in these Sony cameras, eye autofocus, uh, real-time tracking, all of that. Uh, and I found that the focus was fast and accurate. Um, I will try and test the focus speed in my next video, but I am not a sports photographer and I don't have a camera that really lends itself to that kind of test either. I tested this mostly with the a7R IV, not a sports camera but it was very accurate, very responsive. I didn't have any issues focusing uh, with backlight or anything like that. So overall, a very good performance in terms of autofocus. It felt like a native Sony lens. And you do also get in-camera corrections with this lens on these Sony bodies. Of course, for the image quality tests, I will be shooting in RAW and I will turn off all of those corrections so we can see the RAW performance of the lens, but they are built into the camera with this lens. And you can also update the firmware of this lens through the camera. So it seems like you won't be needing their tap-in console anymore, at least from what I'm reading, um, but that's a good thing. And I think it's gonna make it a lot easier because I don't have that and I don't wanna have to buy one. And finally, this lens should be officially released in June for a price of $13.99, which I think personally is a pretty solid price for this. Of course, everybody's budgets and needs are going to be different, but for what it is, this lens has done very well for me and I've really enjoyed using it. But let me know down below what you think of the value of this lens from what you've seen so far. Again, assuming that the image quality is solid, which from what I can see so far, it is. Uh, and if this is a lens that would interest you also, let me know uh, what you want to see tested in that part two video. I have this for a couple more weeks and I will do my best to test as much as I can in that time. The rainy season has started, so I'm not going to have too many more opportunities to really take it out and shoot with it. But uh, let me know and I'll do my best. Otherwise, if you like this video or found it helpful, please do consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing if you haven't already. And I hope to see you next time.